Hello, this is Michael Tracy, and I'm going to tell you a story about a climber who planned to channel the dead spirits of George Mallory and Andrew Irvin to find a long-lost camera on Mount Everest. If found, he planned on smuggling the camera out of China by putting it up his rectum so that the Chinese would not destroy the summit photos. Of course, all did not go as planned, but this is the story of mystery, obsession, and death told by Mark Sinnott in The Third Pole. There are three major themes Sinnott works into his book, and those are outlined in the title, Mystery, Obsession, and Death. Much like Quentin Tarantino's Pulp Fiction, the book is told with multiple plots occurring at the same time and jumps between the past and the present. Unfortunately, for people wanting information about Mallory and Irvin's 1924 climb, you will have to look elsewhere. The number of outright mistakes or major factual errors essentially places the book in the fiction category, but there are still powerful stories being told. The first story told is about obsession, and it has Mark Sinnott getting hooked into looking for Andrew Irvin's body by his old friend Tom Pollard. Mark attends a lecture given by Tom, and they chat afterwards. It is at this point that Tom tells Mark he knows the location of Andrew Irvin's body. Sinnott writes, I was skeptical. You don't think you could actually find him, do you? What if I had a critical piece of information that no one else had? Tom replied, like what? He paused for a few seconds, like the exact location of the body. Mark is skeptical, but they go off on a journey to meet the mystical wizard, Tom Holzell, who is drinking some type of hallucinogenic mixture and told them how if you stare at some aerial photo long enough, you can see Andrew Irvin. Mark is very skeptical of all this, and the section about Hosel is rather humorous, with numerous jokes told at Hosel's expense. However, it is after that meeting with Hosel that Tom comes up with his plan to find Irvin. Not long afterward, Tom started talking about how he was going to channel the spirits of Mallory and Irvin to help solve the mystery, and if we did find the camera, how he would smuggle it out of China in his ass. In the car, Tom broke the silence. I'm getting the feeling that you're not going to be able to walk away from this. He locked me with his hooded, bloodshot eyes and held out his hand. I nodded slowly and took it. Thus, the obsession was born, full of idealism, if not entirely based on sound reasoning. And the rest of the book shows how that mountain took that idealism piece by piece and destroyed it, leaving the largest mystery of the book. How do you go from being a true believer, willing to put the camera up your ass to protect the summit photos from the Chinese, to thinking Mallory and Irvin never stood a chance and the Chinese are the best hope for finding out what happened. Unfortunately, that mystery is not answered in the book. I will note that there is a large divergence between Tom Pollard's beliefs post-2019 and Mark Sinnott's. Although Tom was absolutely certain where Irvin was prior to 2019, the search showed that the Hozo slot was only 9 to 12 inches wide and could never have had a body. In addition, Frank Smythe had crossed that exact spot in 1933, so the body was clearly never there. After the 2019 search, Tom adopted an attitude that you really can't know anything about Mallory and Irvin's climb, the exact opposite of the zealous conviction he used to convince Mark to go on the trip in the first place. On the other hand, Mark Sinnott is now just as convinced that he has figured out what happened on the 1924 climb, and his book presents it as fact. We now know that Mallory and Irvin ultimately did choose the ridge because the 1999 Mallory and Irvin research expedition found one of their oxygen bottles stashed in some rocks just below the first step. And contrast this with Tom's recent post. The idea of this video is that nobody knows anything. If anybody tells you they know, they don't. There's no real evidence anywhere that proves that they took one route or another route. Tom has interviewed Mark Sinnott numerous times and never cleared up this mystery of how Mark knows exactly what route they took. The next major subject covered in the book is death. Mark again uses his friend Tom Pollard to explain exactly what the mountain can do to a person. Drawing the obvious parallel to George Mallory, Mark uses Tom's third trip to Everest to discuss both obsession and death. Much like Mallory, Tom did not reach the summit on his first two trips to the mountain, and as with both men, there were various reasons why this didn't happen. On the third trip, Tom is determined to make it, and Mark describes Tom literally stepping over a dying woman. This was Sunita Hazra. Her gloves were off, and she was holding her hands out. She wasn't moving. As far as Tom could tell, she was dead. For the second time in about 15 minutes, Tom stepped over another body and continued on. However, just prior to that, Tom had stepped over another climber he knew was alive, Gotum Gosh. Is he alive? asked Tom. At that exact moment, almost as if Gosh had been listening, the body twitched and Tom nearly jumped out of his skin. Tom kindly stepped over him and headed for the summit. Later, when Tom returned to South Cole, he found out that a British soldier named Leslie Binns had abandoned her own summit attempt to rescue Hazra and that Hazra was indeed alive and would make it back down the mountain. Gosh, unfortunately, was not rescued and perished on the mountain. 
But all of this just creates the mystery of why someone who on his third trip to the mountain literally stepped over two dying people so he could make the summit, and yet Tom could not realize that the same obsession with reaching the summit might have gripped George Mallory. And this gets us into the third main theme of the book, and that is the mystery. For Mark Sinnott, there is no mystery as to what happened to Mallory and Irvin. They turned around at the second step and fell in a free climbing accident. However, the mysteries he creates relate to what I claim to be deliberate mistakes in the book. Viewers do not like the whole post-truth concept, so I will not go into that at this time. I will merely point out some rather obvious mistakes that it makes and leave it to the viewer to decide whether they were just honest mistakes or whether there was some other message. A similar thing was done in Pulp Fiction with the famous line of Samuel L. Jackson reciting a verse from the Bible. Well, that verse does not exist in the Bible. It was made up with only a handful of words matching the actual verse. Exactly why that was done is one of the mysteries. In the third poll, the mistake that sticks out at me the most is where Senate reports the height of the second step as being 28,600 feet. While various altitudes are used for the second step, largely depending on whether you're referring to the base, the start of the crux, or the top, these range from 28,200 to 28,300. There is a step at 28,600 that is just a short distance from the final summit pyramid, and that is the third step. Does Mark Sinnott not know the altitude of the second step? Or is he really telling us that Odell saw them at 28,600 feet, which is the third step? Sinnott says that one of the letters found on Mallory's body was from Ruth, when in fact no such letter was found. Is that a simple mistake? Or is he telling you that when you find out that the letter from Ruth really wasn't there, it will tell you something important? There is a factually incorrect statement about the death zone. You can look at the numbers yourself, and you will see that there are not 24,772 climbs during that period, nor were the vast majority of the deaths in the death zone. The actual number of deaths recorded for that period are 292, and only 110 of those occurred in the so-called death zone. Nor does this require any programming skills to see. The Himalayan Database Organization has a PDF report that summarizes all sorts of facts and figures, and a simple look at the graph for deaths on all Himalayan mountains shows the exact same phenomenon, that the vast majority of deaths are not actually in the death zone. So why did Sinop make this mistake? I'll get into all of that if I do a post-truth review of the book. I won't go through every single factual error, but there is a major change that has taken place since the book was published, and that relates to the account of the second visit to George Mallory's body. Tom Pollard and Andy Pollitz returned to the body about two weeks after it was buried and dug it up. Tom then crawled underneath Mallory to look at his face. Years ago, it was reported that Pollard photographed Mallory's face, but Sinnott clearly states that no photographs were taken, noting... Tom considered taking a photo of Mallory's face, but after the photo that had been published in The Sun and all the outrage that had rained down on the team as a result, he balked. He would later regret his decision not to document the wound he saw in Mallory's head. However, now it is not clear whether he took the photos or not. In a recent post, Tom has merely said he is refusing to state whether he took the photographs. Another mystery. Of course, there is much more in the book, such as stories about using the drone, the Sherpa revolt, and Mark Sinnott's feelings while he stares into the empty slot where they were certain Irvin's body would be prior to starting the expedition. Ultimately, the third poll is a thinking person's book. As you read it, you need to be thinking what is true, what is deliberately false, and why is he telling me this particular story. If you just want to read a fairy tale about two people who died trying to climb a mountain with little hope of having made the summit, there is that basic story. But anyone who has read a fairy tale not ruined by Disney will know there is a much deeper truth. And sometimes that truth involves a wolf pretending to be something it is not.